Welcome back everyone. We're looking at what are the indicators that I might be stuck in a relationship that is less than healthy. I cannot proceed through the stages of grief and loss. I cannot move into wholeness if I am stuck in a relationship that is unhealthy. Uh, Jim, thank you. Jim Valentine. I appreciate that. Um, so one of the indicators is um, if you find yourself in an anxiety producing relationship, um, the nature of that is it is dysfunctional and toxic. And so you are having to withhold truth. You're being negatively impacted. And the flip side of hurt is anger. Anger will produce, or if you're, if you're injured, if you're emotionally injured, you're going to, part of you is going to go in the fight flight syndrome. You feel backed into a corner or you're losing control or you cannot speak and you can't be honest. That's going to produce anger. Anger produces adrenaline. So if you are anxious and the vast majority of people in the US, right? The majority of people in the US are on um, medication. And if you need medication, there's nothing wrong with that. You need to be able to um, especially for a time, if it has to do with dealing with an anxiety and depression, you need to um, have something to help you cope. But the next question is this, have you looked at what's causing that? And more than likely on some level, you are in a toxic relationship. You're in an anxiety producing relationship. How do you know? Well, you're probably not speaking the truth in love. You're probably not speaking the truth. And again, love is not nice. It's being effective. It doesn't mean being aggressive. Okay? But part of the goal of counseling is to learn how to become honest in a reasonable fashion, how to learn what's the difference between my stuff versus somebody else. So what's, what are some characteristics of anxiety-producing relationships? They are one-sided relationships. If you find yourself doing all the giving, you're giving and giving and giving, you're putting up with, you're tolerating, you're sucking it up, that's probably an indication that you are in a one-sided relationship. Thus, you're going to feel anxious. The truth is, you're angry under the surface. So if you are anxious, more than likely, you've become detached from your emotions, you've become detached from your anger, and so you can't recognize your anger. But if you are anxious, the vast majority of anxiety comes from anger. And it probably is reasonable anger. It contains truth. To the extent that you allow truth to come up, the vast majority of anxiety will come down. That doesn't mean act upon your anger in a knee-jerk fashion. It doesn't mean that at all. It simply means you'd better become aware of it so that you can figure out what to do about the nature of the anxiety-producing relationship. Another one is anxiety producing relationships are superficial relationships. How many people remain in relationships for an extended period of time, yet they think they have a relationship? The most common thing as I work with folks, the most common thing I encounter is that people are in relationships, but they haven't been honest. There's a reason why but they're probably disconnected from that. The reason why is they're afraid. They're afraid to speak the truth. And so what they've done without knowing it is, instead of speaking the truth in love, they are taking matters into their own hands. They're trying to figure out what to do without being honest. So without knowing it, they are rewriting Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Well, somebody has to protect my heart. If I am too fearful to risk, to risk being honest, I will not be honest and I'll keep it to myself. And then I'm left with what? I'm left trying to do the best that I can with the given situation. I'm left hoping this relationship is going to change. But what happens if you've ended up with a peg? That means you're going to continue doing what? You're going to keep casting your pearls. So 
the inability to speak truth in a relationship in a, in a healthy way, to reestablish boundaries is a significant part of what keeps people stuck, if not virtually all. It really comes down to virtually the vast majority of stuff that somebody deals with happens to do, uh, deal with the inability to establish boundaries properly. Relationships are only as genuine and real as the extent to which they are rooted and grounded in truth and invite input and feedback. If you're in a relationship with someone who has given you the message that he doesn't want to hear about it or that she's not open to this, to whatever you have to say, then you don't have a real relationship. It's all their way or the highway. So why are you staying in that relationship? Why haven't you been honest? For fear that the relationship, so the relationship then depends upon what? Depends upon you sacrificing yourself as far as your essential personhood, your voice, your preference. That's casting pearls. You have to begin to look at how long has this been going on and why haven't you been able to be honest? It doesn't make you bad. It doesn't make you good, bad, or indifferent. The question is this. What is the right thing? If you do nothing, the question is this. As things stand now, so if you find yourself in a relationship that is toxic, let's say that is unhealthy, that is hurtful, this can help you determine whether or not you have anything to lose. Okay. As things are now, if you could look into the future in five years from now, and if you found that they were the dynamics within the relationship were exactly the same, would that be okay with you? How about two years? If you found at this point how things are and how things have been, okay, if, if things have been this way in a dissatisfying relationship, in a hurtful, emotionally abusive relationship, or worse, but if it's worse, then there needs to be separation. You need to get out. But if it's one that is slowly standing on your oxygen tube and you're slowly suffocating to death, if you found out it was going to be this way in two years from now, would that be acceptable for, uh, to you? And if it would not, then the question is, if you don't make a change, if you don't start speaking the truth in a strategic way, in an effective way, then it's probably going to stay the same. That's why if you think back a year or two years or three years, it feels the same. So as, as they say in some aspects of psychology, if you do the same thing you've always done, some of you know this, right? If you do the same thing you've always done, you're going to get the same thing you've always gotten. That's the definition of insanity, is doing the same thing you've always done and thinking you're going to get a different outcome. It's not going to happen. How do you know? Because if you can see back over the course of a year or two years or three years or longer, the reason it hasn't changed is because the person you have in mind doesn't intend for it to change unless you haven't been honest with them. And to a large extent, you haven't been honest. Now, if they can clearly see it on your face, then that's a degree of honesty, isn't it? If I hurt somebody's feelings, they don't necessarily have to say it. I can see it in their face. I can see it in their eyes. That's also speaking the truth. That's maybe not a verbal way, but if I can see that I've emotionally hurt somebody, if I've impacted someone, then that speaks volumes. Eyes are the window to the soul. Okay, if a picture is worth a thousand words, if I glance at someone and I can tell I've negatively impacted them, then that person doesn't necessarily need to add, hey, you know what you said actually hurt? Because I probably can tell. So there are times that I actually have said enough by the fact that little by little, this person has been chipping away at me and causing me to become a shell of myself. That is not healthy. 
If I'm a shell of myself, then guess what? I've been giving my pearls, and now I virtually have nothing left yeah, to give. That's called burnout. Okay, So to the extent that you fear to say something to someone you're connected to is the extent to which you do not have a relationship. You're settling for proximity rather than intimacy, and that happens all the time. Think about during the holidays. You have people that get together, and if you could have taken their, their blood pressure and muscle tension before they got together around that Thanksgiving table, or the Christmas table, or the table at Mother's Day, or think, uh, any, any day, and if there are some people around that table that their bodies are telling them, or showing them, that this is not a positive experience, this is not an enjoyable experience, then the question is, why did they do this? Well, what are you what are you saying, John? I mean, this is this right? this is what families do, really. Yeah, a lot of families. But the question is this: Is it right? Is it just and is it fair? Is it right to have people around a table that they're not enjoying themselves? To create an environment where it's all about me. Maybe I'm at the head of the table, and I feel. Uh, the right to kind of um, say what I want to say, and everybody has to sit there and, and listen to it. And I'm not just talking about droning on, but that, that could be an issue too. In, in families that, people within the family, if you have a family that has people that are hurting, you have a family that you have at least one black hole person that has been benefiting at the expense of someone else. The black hole person is the pig. The reason a pig can be a pig is no one is placing boundaries on him. A pig can be isolated, and that's okay. He can be a pig by himself. Okay. Um, Anxiety-producing relationships are at your expense. They're not benefiting you, and you're giving your pearls again. Anxiety-producing re relationships are not honest or real. You're going through the motions. Okay, why? And how long? How long could this keep going on? Until somebody who isn't benefiting anymore says, you know what, this isn't working. And truth be told, everybody wants family. In a perfect world, I mean, if you had, if you had a, a family of decent people, kids always want to be around family. Adult children want to be around their parents. So if that's not the case, then something has happened. Now, if something happened, the question is, has the parent apologized sincerely? Have they put their money where their mouth is? Have they made amends to the extent that they can? That's the best, the most, and the only thing they can do. If they have done that, then it's up to the adult children to decide what they're going to do with that. And if the adult parent, adult parent, if the parent has asked for forgiveness, then the children, the adult children, are obligated to forgive. Now that's different than intimacy. Forgiveness is granted when asked. Intimacy is earned. But generally speaking, what you're going to find is, unless someone who has been hurt made the choice to become bitter, ultimately it's a choice. If I've chosen to become bitter, what I'll find is if someone then genuinely sees, sees the light and apologizes in humility, you know, it won't be enough for me because I'm no longer interested in the relationship. Now I'm just interested in hurting. That's my issue. If that happens, then the parent who has seen the light, has apologized, has made amends to the extent that they can, has demonstrated a track record of being different, then they have to allow the adult child to, in a way, go their own way. Because the adult child now may be morphing into a pig, and hence that'll be an anxiety-producing relationship. So up until this point, I've been talking about the adult child being anxious around the parents. But you can have a situation now where the parents are anxious around the kids not to say anything. Some of the issues I deal with in social media are the trans deception, the trans movement. 
the trans movement is filled with a lot of hurting kids that are being manipulated, by the way, and that's why I'm so concerned. They're being manipulated by predators, financial predators, sexual predators, and others that are going to use them and exploit them. I have a huge concern about that. But you have some kids also, some young people, that have gone into the trans movement to spite their parents. That's a different ball game because now you're dealing with not just a wounded kid, but a kid that has elected to become angry and to do that to hurt their parents. I have no right to act in such a way that I'm going to get them back. That is my issue. And parents, if any parent is listening, if you have somebody in your life that has gone in a certain direction, in a, into a certain lifestyle to get you back, you cannot be held hostage by that. You apologize, you make amends, and if they are hell-bent, as it were, to rub it in your face, then for you to maintain a relationship with them is casting your pearls before a swine. Those happen to be some of the, mo the most difficult kind of situations where a parent, out of guilt, continues a relationship with a, a child that has now become hurtful that they're doing this and sometimes we can see it we can see that they're not making good decisions but at the same time if they have allowed a root of bitterness to grow then that's between them and the lord i cannot be a part of that why because now the relationship has become toxic and disrespectful it's become hurtful and i have to let that go if the if the adult child ever wants to come back it's the same the criteria is the same for any of us. It's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins with a humble and contrite spirit, right? if we confess our sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The, the doorway into unconditional forgiveness is very conditional. I have to demonstrate the fruits of repentance. Without that, I'm not sorry. Somebody who's sorry, you won't have to wonder, and they'll be consistent. What are some lies? So we've looked at the indicators of toxic relationships and um, that I'm stuck, because if I'm stuck, I'm going to end up having unhealthy relationships. I will permit that. I'll facilitate that in one way or another. I'll tolerate it. I'll cast my pearls before swine. We've looked previously at some lies that will cause us to be stuck. We're going to look at a few more. One of the lines is, well, every parent cares about their child. Really? A significant number of the men that I used to work with within the prison setting um, had, had lots of kids. You tell me, did they care about their kids? Probably not. They had their baby daddies, and they had bunches of, bunches of babies. Why did they do that? Because they were using women, and the, those gals trusted them? And now they were stuck, they're stuck as single mothers. Those are not honorable parents. So no, we wish and we want that every parent cares about their child, but it's not true. Everyone does, does the best they can with what they're given. That is very prevalent now in the world of psychology. You know, well, give, they tried their best. They really are. They really are trying their best given what they've been given. You'll hear that. That is not true. Does that mean somebody, anybody will be perfect? Meaning if they're, they're interested in trying to be a decent person. No, it's not about perfection, but the question is this. When they are wrong, how do they respond? When they know they've been hurtful, how do they respond? Are they reasonable? We're not talking about perfection. The question is, is the person reasonable? So the next question is this. Is it ever reasonable never to apologize? Is it ever reasonable never to say that you love someone that you supposedly care about? Well, but in their day, they never... Okay, you can keep saying these things. No, in their day, there's always been decent people and selfish people in every single generation. Well, in the day that my dad was... Okay, is your dad, dad still alive? Is your mom still alive? Then do they have access currently to good counseling material? Are there programs that they could tune into 
that could help them improve themselves? Of course there are. We cannot cut somebody some slack when it has to do with salving their, uh, their egos and allowing their egos to still grow. Why? Because it's going to continue to be unhealthy. Let's see if there's any questions. Okay, now we're good. Um, a couple more, uh, some of the, the lies. Uh, given her background, you know what? She really doesn't know what she's doing. After all, look at the example she had or he had. So excusing away irresponsibility, assuming that just because someone's, uh, the example they were given is what's going to be perpetuated. That is very common. No, we're not responsible for what we were given, but we are responsible for what we do with it. How did you know not to continue to repeat the past? How did you know to treat someone differently than your parent treated you? After all, look at the example you were given. The only reason you chose not to treat your kids the way you were treated is what? Is your conscience. Well, doesn't your parent have a conscience? And that's really where things start to um, become clear. The question is not are our parents good or bad? That's not the issue. But the question is this, or anyone, the question is to what extent are they right or are they wrong? To what extent are they willing to place someone else above themselves? That has to do with conscience. Here's some of the, uh, a few more lies that will keep us stuck. Uh, well, he really loves you or she really loves you, but she just doesn't know how to say it or show it. Really? Well, the question is, does she ever know how to sort of turn it on and turn it off when it benefits her? So she just doesn't know. He just doesn't know how to put some monosyllabic words together, such as, I love you. I'm proud of you. That, that They can't form those sentences then they probably also aren't forming some other sentences. So let me ask you, is it ever right to never say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I will change? I actually know some people who, as I think about it, I can never remember them sincerely apologizing, let alone ever saying, I'm sorry. Can you imagine what kind of person you would be if you went through life and you never once said, I'm sorry? That would be inexcusable. Is it right? Is it just? Or is it fair? That has nothing to do with upbringing. Especially if somebody was married or somebody got married. I can tell you, they probably didn't find their spouse and persuade them to marry them if they hadn't and nice things come out of their mouth. So they can demonstrate how to turn it on, how to say nice things when it benefits them. And this is the big problem uh, that we find in churches or any kind of gatherings, but especially churches. There's so many people that are hypocrites that are playing the game and kids watch it. They see their mom, who was miserable at home, a mother Gothel, step out of the car and the moment she steps out of the car or the dad this is not related to gender per se but can you imagine if mother gothel went to church with um, rapunzel so you have a single mother bringing her daughter in tow and they're sitting there oh the worst day is mother's day right she would be preening and don't tell me mother gothel didn't know how to turn on the charm i mean just watch how she poses at times she's just wonderful until you're behind closed doors in the tower, and until Rapunzel found her voice, and then the real Mother Gothel came out. So the question is this, another question. Um, when someone shows that side of them, is that the exception or is that actually them? If you have an alcoholic in your life, a part of you is driven to excuse the drunk times and say they don't know what they're doing. But I submit to you, when they're drunk, they've taken the brakes off their, they've become, um, they have their inhibitions lowered and the true them comes out. If you doubt that, then tell them 
to be nice now. Tell them you're, you're beginning to suspect that the drunk them is the real them, and you don't want to see that anymore. If they care about the relationship, they're not going to do that anymore. And watch what happens. Um, if you're just patient enough, so here's another line, another lie. If you're just patient enough, meaning put up with it long enough, she'll finally be able to bring herself to where she can say that she loves you and thank you and be thankful and say thank you. That's a lie. If they were thankful, they would have already said thank you. It is unbelievable to think that somebody would go through this life and not say thank you. And trust me, the person you're thinking of right now has probably said thank you to other people when it benefits them. And here's another line. This is what God wants for you. He'll reward you for your patience. If you just hang in there long enough, you're going to be rewarded. But Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. It is not noble to go against what Jesus said. If you have a pig in your life, it is time to begin to reassess whether or not your home should be a pig pen. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking about the condition of the physical condition, but the emotional condition. You have to make a change. Why? Because if you don't, what you have now is what you're probably going to have in the future. And if you found out, again, that in the future, if you don't do anything, if you found out that two years from now you were going to be in the exact same place, would that be acceptable to you? Haven't you had enough? It is not spiritual to become a doormat. It is not spiritual to allow someone to be abused emotionally. It is not spiritual to step aside and allow someone who has become an oppressor to have at the kids once you find out, once you clearly see that they've been manipulating and that they have no intention to stop. As a matter of fact, now what you've done is you are not defending the defenseless any longer. That is not spiritual. That needs to change. And we will pick it up at this point on the next edition of Journey to Healing. You've been listening to Journey to Healing, sponsored by SurvivorSupport.net. We trust you've been helped by the information our host, John Euler, has shared. To donate to this ministry, schedule a personal consultation with John, or to arrange a professional training for your church or organization with John, simply visit our website. On behalf of Survivor Support, we look forward to hearing from you and to have you join us next time on Journey to Healing.